On Tech News Today, we've got big Microsoft news about Windows 10, Bing, and a cool new app you're going to want to download immediately. Plus, Apple is launching a social network that you're not allowed to join, and we'll tell you about a streaming music option that costs only four bucks a month. It's all coming up next on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Thursday, May 14th, 2015. This episode is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. Are you hiring? With ZipRecruiter.com, you can post to 100 plus job sites, including social networks, all with a single click. Screen, rate, and hire the right candidates fast. Try ZipRecruiter with a free four day trial now at ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT. And by Prosper. Prosper is a peer-to-peer -peer lending marketplace that connects people who are looking to borrow money with those who have money to lend. Visit prosper.com slash twit and receive a $50 Visa gift card when you get a loan. Tech News Today is the show where we talk about the tech news with the journalists who report it. My name is Mike Elgin, and joining us today as co-anchor is CNET tech reporter Ben Fox Rubin. Welcome to you, Ben. Hey, how's it going? It's going Thanks great. For now, you're not the CEO of Meerkat, is that correct? Apparently, I'm not, but we needed to make sure. So, yeah, yeah. Um, so you did a story yeah. on this. You interviewed the other Ben Rubin. And uh, let's throw that up on the screen there, Jason. And, and, and there's a hilarious picture. Now, who's giving whom flowers? So Ben Rubin, not me, uh, gave me flowers. And uh, it, was, it was totally unexpected. I was actually kind of miffed that this guy was getting so much attention off of my name. And yeah. it ended up that... Um, the first second I met him, you know, right right when we were introducing ourselves, he surprises me with a dozen red roses. So um, I kind of had to change my tune pretty quickly after that and realize the guy was actually pretty nice. Very nice. And, you know, it was kind of an apology for riding on your coattails and and uh, and all that uh, and trying to, to, to profit from your, from your fame. I would have uh, held out for maybe some stock options or something like that on Meerkat, but flowers. You think so? <laughs> And in fact, yeah, it, I guess so. It's it's sometimes it's fun to get to write stories like that anyway. So yeah. uh, it was it was really cool to meet the guy. It really had very little to do with um, like all the Meerkat Periscope stuff or the yeah. copyright infringement issues. Um, so sometimes in the tech world, we get to have a little bit of fun. And this was just an opportunity to get to meet the other Ben Rubin and just ask him a bunch of ridiculous questions that had very little to do with uh, all that other stuff. Yeah, it's hilarious. And in fact, we. Uh, we this morning, you know, we've interviewed uh, Ben Rubin and we've had you on this show and, uh, you know, multiple times. And so we have we have the people that we interview already built into the system with lower thirds and all that kind of stuff. And so we spent uh, probably five minutes this morning trying to contact the other Ben Rubin. And it just, uh, you know, it's it's uh, it's rough. But you had the prescience to insert the word your, your middle name Fox in there, knowing that there might be other Ben Rubens running around. You've been doing this for a long time to differentiate yourself against the the lesser Ben Rubens out there. Uh, anyway, a lot of fun. And yeah. I'm glad we got you the correct Ben Rubin on the show. So why don't we jump into the news? Uh, we got a late breaking story today. A report on Fortune says that Apple is running into problems with HomeKit which has now been delayed from an expected launch next month to later in the year, possibly August or September, according to the report. Apple never publicly announced a launch date, but the delay may be affecting plans from the many companies who intend to support the platform with third-party home automa uh, automation products. And uh, Ben Fox Rubin, apparently it's not that easy uh, to develop an entirely new platform for disparate uh, home automation products. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but you kind of have to play in that space if uh, you're going to be doing tech stuff these days. I mean, like that is, that's a big part of their um, Internet of Things play, right, Mike? Uh, absolutely. And it's, and, and again, you know, this is something, you know, it's one of my uh, little pet peeves about the Internet of Things. People say, oh, this is going to work like this. It's going to work like that. And my prediction is, no, it isn't. We can't even get TV remotes working right. I mean, it's with 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 a lack of standards or the plethora of standards. Actually, uh, it's going to be very difficult. And of course, Apple's in a reasonably okay position because they're really good at controlling the infrastructure. But again, they're running into these kinds of delays. I think everybody's going to be running into these delays. And it's I, I don't think the Internet of Things is going to be and the home automation world is going to be quite what people make it out to be. I think it's going to be less. There's going to be less. Uh, 
you know, universal standards. It's going to be harder to network these things than, than people are saying. And I don't think that there's just because we have little chips and little radios and all that kind of stuff that we can build into everything. Uh, it doesn't mean that these things not only are going to all work together seamlessly, but also be secure and do some of the other things we want them to do, like function, for example. So, uh, you know, that's kind of bad news. I was looking forward to seeing what they do. Now, the report did say that they may have a sort of limited uh, quasi announcement at their uh, upcoming developer event and I wouldn't be surprised about that I think but the plan I believe was for them to actually roll it out at that event well our look I think um, I, I, I think at the end of the day it's better if they roll it out as a somewhat well thought out system as opposed to just kind of trying to push it out for a particular event or what have you so uh, I, I guess that's the silver lining when it comes to that. Um, so you don't really want another Apple Maps debacle or anything like that. And as you were saying, Internet of Things is going to be really, really complicated. So uh, if they take a little bit more time and try to get it a little closer to right, uh, to me, that does make a lot of sense. It does. And of, of course, um, you know, I think I've been uh, uh, predicting for a little while what is probably pretty obvious, which is that they're probably going to build this into Apple TV. There have been reports based on inside sources that it will be, you know, Apple TV will be a, a, a major component of this, this uh, HomeKit uh, project. Uh, and that's one of the problems with this delay, which is, of course, that Apple want, will probably want to announce the big Apple TV news, and they're not going to be ready for the big HomeKit news. They'll probably roll out the new Apple TV It'll probably have stuff in there that supports HomeKit, but they won't actually do it. They've done this with a number of products. If they're not ready, they just ship the product. You know, the Apple Watch, for example, has, uh, has uh, you know, features in it that haven't been activated yet because they haven't got the various approvals and so on. Well, our top story today is Microsoft news. In fact, we got a ton of Microsoft news today. Microsoft yesterday announced that Windows 10 will ship in many product editions, proving once again that Microsoft has learned nothing about creating confusion with multiple product names. The company named six of them, which are Windows 10 Mobile, Windows 10 Mobile Enterprise, Windows 10 Home, Windows 10 Pro, Windows 10 Enterprise, and Windows 10 Education. In addition, the company will later announce the names for editions of Windows for ATMs, cash registers, robots, the Internet of Things, Xbox, HoloLens, and the Surface Hub, and who knows what else. I uh, didn't mention a car in there either. Uh, ben Fox, Ruben, how bad is it that my, that Microsoft always comes out with these multiple product names, which clearly confuse a lot of consumers? Sorry, I, I had a really hard time following all those names. Yeah. What was that? Two different, two different mobile apps. I, I, I mean, it's. I guess it's part and parcel to how Microsoft thinks about things. So, in some ways. They can't avoid it. They they can't get away from that kind of stuff. So I, I guess, you know, old habits die hard in that regard. But uh, maybe it'll work because everybody seems to think that Windows 10 is going to be the savior for Microsoft and a lot of the problems that Microsoft has had. But um, obviously, right out of the gate, having all these different uh, complicated names, I, I mean, I don't even know where to get started with some of those. So you know, we'll see what happens. It seems to me, and of course, this is really easy for me to say because <laughs> I don't have to implement it, but it seems to me that this should be programmatic. In other words, that you should go and say, I'm going to buy Windows. And then it, you, when you download it, it basically determines what your situation is and you get whatever components are necessary to enable the features that you are expecting as an education user or whatever. Uh, and, you know, Stop confusing people because, of course, there, there are psychological issues with buying things. Buyer's remorse, the paralysis of choice. These are famous, well-known economic, uh, behavioral economic realities that cause people to say, you know, I'm confused. I think I'm just not going to do anything. I'm not going to buy. I'm not going to download. Uh, you know, Apple, for example, uh, you know, Microsoft's trying to unify through the name. They put Windows on everything. Apple, on the other hand, has two operating systems with different names. So there's OS 10 and then there's iOS. And and within those two categories, there are literally two versions. There's OS 10 and there's iOS. At least that's a perception that consumers have and they don't have to stress out about it. So I think this is a big mistake. Personally, I think this is a big mistake on Microsoft part. Everybody talks about the new Microsoft, but apparently they're not that new. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. It's it's we'll we'll see where the rubber meets the road, whether there are critical enough changes for it to actually be, you know, all platforms or multi-platform. I'm kind of 
disgusted at using the term multi-platform, but if, if it really does work across your tablet and your smartphone and your, your laptop and your desktop, then maybe there are going to be enough good things to, to make it worthwhile for people to upgrade. But you know, the example that you suggested makes a lot of sense. Uh, I, I don't know that they would ever do that in one way for the enterprise software or for the education software. They're able to sell that, I believe, at a premium. So what incentive do they have if they bundle it all in one package and just kind of, I mean, maybe you could sell uh, different components for a premium. I'm not sure, but obviously they didn't go down that route. Yeah. Yeah, obviously. And uh, it is it is curious. And, and I believe this is actually more than they've had before. They've increased the number of versions, I believe. Uh, Sounds but, wonderful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because they didn't have enough before. Well, we got more news for you in a sec. But first, let's talk about hiring somebody. Now, we just talked about you got to sometimes you have to hire somebody to build your website. You want to make sure it's mobile friendly and you want to make sure that it's an awesome website. Where do you hire people? These days, I mean, it's, you know, people are scattered all over the place. There's so many job boards there. You know, people are on social networks. Well, the place to go is go directly to ZipRecruiter, one of our sponsors today. You can post 100 plus job sites with a single click. And you can also post on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Google Plus. And, you know, Twitter is especially powerful because you can set up ZipRecruiter so that every time you have a new job post, it's automatically tweeted instantly. Uh, you don't have to lift a finger to make that happen. Just post once, and within 24 hours, the qualified candidates will come rolling in to ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use interface. They, you can search more than 5 million resumes. Yeah, that's right. They have their own resume database, and they add thousands of new resumes to it every single day. Uh, you can collaborate with team members. You can create personalized responses when candidates apply. ZipRecruiter's been used by more than 400,000 businesses and delivered more than 53 million candidate applications. Try ZipRecruiter today with a free 4 day trial and get your perfect candidate before they go to somebody else by going to ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT. Well, uh, in other Microsoft news, Microsoft is announcing the upcoming rollout of a new algorithm for their Bing search engine that favors mobile-friendly sites. Barry Schwartz is the publisher of Search Engine Roundtable and wrote about the story for Search Engine Land. Welcome to you, Barry Schwartz. Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks for being on. Google Meg moves last month, of course, to favor mobile sites with its Google Mobile Friendly update. How is Microsoft's approach different? So Microsoft is trying to take a more slow rollout to make it not, they're not giving us a date. They're not telling us, you know, this mobile friendly algorithm will be launched on this specific date. They're telling us, we're going to keep giving you information. We're going to tell you things as we go forward. We're going to give you tools, um, like a tool to test your site, all of which Google has given um, to publishers before they launched their algorithm, but they're saying we're going to push off our algorithm if webmasters are not ready for it. Um, there was a lot of um, fear uh, when Google announced their mobile al uh, friendly algorithm, uh, mostly because of what publishers are writing around coining it the mobile get in. Um, but the truth was, when it launched, it really did not have that much of an impact on the search results as expected. And I think just Bing is a little cautious about that, and they don't want webmasters to freak out. And on the other hand, I kind of have a feeling um, they just don't know. I think they're in the early stages. They've been working on it for about a year, they told me. But I really think they're kind of in the early stages of this algorithm. And um, I think they're still trying to work out the kinks, so they, want, they don't want to give a date specifically because of that. So, Barry, one of, one of the things that I was kind of curious about with this story is, um, why, why does it take so long for both Google and Microsoft to come out with these different mobile friendly algorithms? Is it really complicated? Uh, because it's not like consumers haven't needed this type of thing where you, where you describe something as mobile friendly, um, before, I mean, I kind of feel like it could have come out years ago. So it's complicated for a couple of reasons. And I don't think, well, let me step back. There's two complications. One is for Google to understand, if I'm, or search engines to understand if a site is mobile friendly, they need to be able to render the website like a user, like you and I would see it. So back even a couple of years ago, their spiders, Googlebot and Bingbot, were only able to render the page without JavaScript, without CSS, without the, the formatting aspects of it. The only way for them to tell if their website is mobile friendly is to be able to render the page as a mobile user would see it, which means they have to generate the CSS, the JavaScript, and all the things that actually make it mobile friendly. And that requires a lot more engineering behind it. And of course, 
when you build something like that out, it's very hard to test and they have to test it over, over a course of time. Now, Google's been testing or using what's called a mobile-friendly label. When you go to the Google search results and you see on your mobile device a mobile-friendly like label on the actual snippet uh, for a while now. I think it's back in, uh, I don't even know, I think last November. I could be wrong, but I think it was, it, was, it was a while now. So Google's able to actually determine if your website is mobile-friendly for a, a while now. And Bing has been testing their mobile-friendly label for at least a month. So they've been able to, to actually, they're actually able to detect, to detect now if a site is mobile friendly. In terms of the second aspect is, so the first aspect is detecting if a website is mobile friendly and they're both able to do that right now without a problem. The second aspect is how are they going to adjust the rankings? They don't want to say uh, if a website is not mobile friendly but it's really, very, very relevant for a specific query. Uh, they don't want to like not have that un- non-mobile friendly website not show up in the mobile results because what if it's the only mobile friendly? What if it's the only relevant result for the query? They want to show it, even though it's not mobile friendly. So it's really about massaging and finding the right balance between showing relevant results at the same time um, showing results that will render nicely on a mobile device. And sometimes there aren't any really relevant results that are mobile friendly. You know, Barry, I'm kind of confused about that because Microsoft seems to be saying that they're not going to favor. Mobile sites really, and the you know they're really going to go after relevance. Relevance uh, trumps mobile friendliness, which means so what's the point of all this? I mean, it, can you so explain that? I, I think that's their way of saying it's going to have a very small weight. Uh, meaning, the only way a mobile friendly website is going to see a boost is if they if you have two websites exactly the same relevance for the same query. The one that's mobile friendly will go a little bit higher. We'll go, we'll go to number one as opposed to number two, and. That's the main difference. I think uh, Bing is saying we don't want people to rush and be afraid to have to go mobile friendly when they're. The problem is, like for you and I to go mobile friendly for our websites, we hire a programmer. We could we could budget for it. We could you know we could implement it. But there's a lot of webmasters, there's a lot of site owners that have old sites back dating ten years ago that are really useful sites, but are just really expensive. They're on old content management systems, and it's hard for them to go mobile friendly. Um, so. I think over time you'll see both Bing and Google um, increase the importance or the weight of that mobile friendly factor uh, and you'll see more and more sites that are not mobile friendly slowly start declining in their rankings in the mobile search results. Because again, even a year ago you wouldn't be surprised to see a website come up that wasn't mobile friendly. You'd have to pinch and zoom to see it, which is what was is somewhat expected um, you know, four years ago less so and very not so expected today and even more so in the future people aren't going to you know settle or be okay with an experience that you have to pinch and zoom with so i think that's the, that's what what bing is trying to say in this rollout that don't worry go mobile friendly we'll take a step by step but that weight in terms of um ranking is not going to be that significant on day one when we release this algorithm yeah one of the one of the Things that I was curious about also is that Microsoft has already been testing this out. Um, you know, have you learned anything from some of these tests? So they only have been testing specifically the mobile label, from what I understand, showing in the mobile search results if a site is mobile friendly. And based on those tests, Microsoft has has told me that by labeling a site mobile friendly, they see that when people click on those results, they stay on the page longer. They're less likely to click back to the search results and find other results. So the user experience for showing mobile-friendly websites and, and having people click on those mobile-friendly re- websites are probably better for the searcher based on you, those searchers staying on that website uh, for a longer period of time. Wonderful. Barry Schwartz is at seoroundtable.com, which oddly enough ranks very high in the search engine rankings. Uh, RustyBrick.com, and you can follow him on Twitter at RustyBrick. Uh, thank you so much, Barry, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. All right. Well, even more Microsoft news for you. Microsoft finally shipped its Hyperlapse video app that it announced last year. The app is available for Android, Windows Phone, and as a desktop Windows application. In other words, pretty much everywhere except Apple operating systems. Like the iOS app Hyperlapse, Microsoft Hyperlapse creates speeded up and smoothed out videos. One benefit of Microsoft's product is that it'll transform existing videos. You don't have to explicitly create it in the app. Also of interest is, the, is that the desktop Windows version is more powerful. It's called Microsoft Hyperlapse Pro, and it offers it in advanced mode, among other things, for high-end action cams like the GoPro. Uh, ben Fox Rubin, I think this is probably going to be a great uh, 
product, but I think their video that we just showed there doesn't make it look very good. I don't think they did a good job with that marketing video. They, they didn't really capture the kinds of scenes that uh, lend themselves to hyperlapse-like uh, creation. But I still would expect Microsoft to have a top-notch tool here. But uh, what are you thinking about this so far? Wait, so so what what would you suggest as like possibly a different kind of video to show off? Because when it, when I heard about this, it just kind of struck me as, okay, you're just providing a fast forward app is that is that basically it well the way i'm i'm a big fan of hyperlapse on on the ios platform and basically what it, the, the secret sauce is that it's actually you know and again i don't know the technology behind microsoft but i assume it's similar to hyperlapse hyperlapse actually monitors the uh, the gyroscope and other sensors in your phone to know when the phone makes tiny little movements that uh, result on video in a kind of shaky look so if you're, you know, if you mount your phone onto a bicycle and go riding your bike down the street, it's going to be, it's going to look like there's an earthquake normally. What uh, Hyperlapse does on iOS is it will actually compensate. It will give you a small frame, and within that frame, it will actually stabilize it so it looks incredibly stable. And I've used it for a lot of things, and I found that if you, if you video people running around in a yard, like Microsoft's example, it just looks like an old time silent movie or something like that. You want to show, you know, race cars going down the street or, you know, uh, action is a really great uh, thing to show. This, this that doesn't look appealing when you show children in fast motion in a playground. I just it just doesn't look like an appealing use of the app. But I, you know, one of my favorite apps um, on the iPhone is actually called Photosynth. Uh, it's a, you know, it's a, it's one of these 360 degree creation tools, and it's great technology. It's been around for a long time. And so Microsoft is really good with with visual uh, effects like this, uh, and I would expect their product. I can't wait to try it out. But still, I think that I think the secret sauce here, of course, is that you can take the videos you took three years ago, and you can put them into this app, and it'll hyperlapse them. With hyperlapse, you can't do that. You have to record the video within the app. So I think this is probably going to be a pretty cool product. Yeah, I think I, I think you're right. Though people need to figure out exactly how to use it. Um, now that you explained a little bit more about it, I guess it, it's it's it makes sense from Mark, Microsoft's marketing perspective to show uh, kids or you know parents using it because those those will probably be most of the types of people that could end up using it. I mean that's a pretty big bundle of people, as opposed to folks that you know race in cars or or something like that. But um, I I think there could be a lot of interesting uses for it. It could also make, um, you know, using GoPros or mobile phones much, much more effective for uh, higher grade types of video. But um, it's, it's, one of, it's another one of those things where you provide these types of tools or services to people and they still kind of need to figure out exactly what's the base, best use case for it. So um, that to me seems to be another one of those types of tools. Yeah, it does. It absolutely does. Well, Apple's rumored streaming music service will have a special social network for artists, according to an exclusive on 9to5Mac. Each artist will have his or her own profile page where they can post samples, videos, pictures, whatever information they want, you know, information about upcoming concerts and so on. The artist will also be able to share the content of other artists. Now, the feature is expected to be called Artists Activity, which to me sounds unlikely. That doesn't sound like an Apple-y name. And it'll be built into the iOS music app, Ben Fox Rubin. Uh, this um, sounds really appealing. And sometimes when people get inside information, they have a partial view of what's going to come out. They describe it and it sounds awful. And then when Microsoft goes out, I mean, I'm sorry, when Apple goes out there and announces it on stage, it sounds really awesome. And this may be one of those cases. In this case, it's what it sounds like is that they're creating a social network for famous people where the rest of us just watch them do their social networking and we're just on the sidelines uh, wishing we could be part of it all. But uh, it's not really <laughs> that clear that like that's exactly what they're doing. Isn't that Twitter already? <laughs> yeah. But but yeah, you're right. Um, probably Apple will, you know, if this, if, if they do end up talking about it and it and it exists, um, they'll they'll probably be able to describe it a little bit better. I think that um, with a lot of these types of services uh, that that are connected to music labels or artists, uh, the the intention is also to try to build out uh, some level of attention or care for the artists themselves and kind of show the music labels that w we care about what it is that you do. So it, maybe, maybe that was the intention is to try to provide the artists with a little bit more control of, uh, their messaging as opposed to just kind of 
forcing you through uh, whatever pipes Apple wants you to go through. So it, to, it, to me, that's where it would, it would kind of make sense. Uh, but yeah, like a little bit more interaction from the user uh, would, would be nicer because otherwise it's not really social. Yeah. But um, I, I mean, I, I don't think Kanye West really wants a bunch of random people pinging him. So right. I, it, that that doesn't make a lot of um, that wouldn't work. Exactly. If, if it's if they spin it as a way for uh, their music app to have tons of artists that you can sort of interact with to a certain extent, that sounds cool. If it's ping that you can't join because you're not the right kind of person, that doesn't sound cool. So we'll see how they, I'm sure they'll figure it out so that it, it's all warm and fuzzy and everybody's happy about it. But so far, it sounds it sounds uh, kind of awful. Well, Wolfram Alpha <laughs> launched a reverse image search tool today. You upload a picture by dragging and dropping and the site tells you, uh, tries to tell you what the picture is all about. You can try it out at the site imageidentify.com. And Ben Fox Rubin, of course, the, the, the immediate um, comparison would be with Google Image Search where you can drag and drop a picture. The difference is Google will say, here are all the other places where we found this picture. Go check out those sites. What this does is says, this is a, you know, this is a cat or whatever. It, it tries to identify in words what is in the picture, it grabs all kinds of available data, whatever's available, and it does its Wolfram Alpha thing by, by harvesting that data and trying to make a, a shot. I tried it today with a picture of myself, and it said, this is a person. And I thought, well, that's kind of vague. I, you know, I wonder if it can have more details. So there's a button that says, you know, can this be improved? And I put that and then offered primate, uh, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, hominid and stuff like that. And I thought, you know, at the end of it, I thought, well, person's fine. Let's go with the person. Uh, what do you think of this? Is this going to be useful? I, not, not really. I don't really know how I would actually use it. Um, having, having written stories about NVIDIA and machine learning and visual computing, I realize how complicated and difficult it is to teach computers to do this kind of stuff. So if you take a step back and realize just how far they've come with with being able there on the screen right now that you could actually not only just say what type like that it's a tiger but what type of tiger it is or what type of cat it is from from a computing perspective yeah that's really impressive however from from a human perspective we seem to be capable of doing that almost immediately and so from from looking at it from uses what am I going to like see a piece of fruit that I've never seen before and then go check with Wolfram what it is? I, I, I just I don't know from a practical perspective exactly when I've actually been in a situation where I'm looking at something and I desperately need to know what it is because I, I can't ask somebody around me or something like that where where I would actually have to go to a search engine to find out. Yeah, the, I'm sure that there's, uh, you know, that their goal ultimately is to automate everything so that cameras can really understand what they're looking at for, you know, all kinds of purposes, everything from manufacturing. You know, you have cam you, you could theoretically have cameras that would watch a conveyor belt to look for certain defects or whatever. Or you could have, you know, uh, conservationists could put cameras out in the in the wild and say, you know, when when the Sasquatch walks by, you know, I don't care about hunters, give me the Sasquatch and notify and all that, whatever. You know, I'm just, a, you know, I don't think it's for people <laughs> to use as a, a consumer tool, but ultimately, I think their goal is probably, you know, sort of a machine learning kind of a automation, uh, extensible uh, thing that you know application developers and websites can use. I think I think that sounds pretty cool, actually. Those are those are some. Those could be compelling uses, absolutely. Um, obviously, we would love to find Sasquatch. So if he's out there and watching Tech News today, hopefully uh, he knows that Wolfram is going to come get him at some point. Yeah, my guess is that he listens but doesn't watch the video. Uh, but again, that's just a guess. I'm probably stereotyping uh, <laughs> viewers, so I probably shouldn't do that. Well, the U.S. Department of Transportation Secretary Anthony Fox announced yesterday in Silicon Valley an acceleration of rules that will require cars in the future to network and communicate with each other. The department is working with the FCC to speed up the testing of a special spectrum for vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication, V2V. The idea is for cars to communicate for the purposes of avoiding crashes, safely tailgating to speed up traffic and enhance self-driving technologies. You know, this is great that they're speeding this up, Ben, but I, I, you know, this kind of technology is not actually going to be required for cars for many, many, many years. But when it is, it's going to probably be pretty cool. 
it, it, not only cool, but uh, I, I think it's really going to save lives. So yeah. uh, the concept of V to V and V to X. So V to V, obviously vehicle to vehicle. V to X is vehicle to literally anything like light posts or the curb or the road or uh, just about anything that you could find on the side of the road. Uh, NXP has talked a lot about this. Uh, they're, they're generally known for um, NFC chips, but they also do a lot in this area. There are a handful of other chip makers that do this too. Um, it's, it's, it's another piece in the puzzle of not just automated or self-driving cars, uh, making, making cars safer that way with reducing human error, but also just finding um, other ways of, of increasing safety. So I, I, I think that um, it's, it's, this could be a really important thing in the future. Granted, it, you're right that it's, it's many years away, but when it does come, uh, it, it, this, is, this, this could be a very critical change uh, in society and potentially make cars uh, a whole lot safer. I agree with you. And it's, a, it's also a, a, a good reason why we want uh, geeks in, in p politics. I think Fox is a, a, is a technology fan. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, a lot of times in government, you know, you see senators and so on going, what is this internet thing? You know, they're, they're like, they're, they're not driving innovation. They're holding it back because they are personally apathetic or ignorant about it. And here we have Fox, who I think is is a really enthusiastic technology fan who really, really wants to get this going. And he's trying to, to, to rush the normal, slow process for getting the rules in place and so on. And uh, I'd like to see a lot more geeks in government uh, so that we can uh, sort of make the world a better place faster. Just my two cents. Well, in product update news, Google announced yesterday that all Chrome extensions not in the Chrome Web Store will be blocked immediately for Windows users and in July for all OS X users. The change is designed to reduce the spread of malicious extensions. The update was supposed to take effect in January, but Google gave developers more time to adapt. Google also updated its Android app, Google Fit, with a custom Android Wear watch face that displays the Google Fit activity ring, which, uh, as you might expect, keeps track of your activity. The app also guesses how many calories you've burned and how far you've traveled. This is really cool. Probably, uh, Ben, a, uh, a you know, response to the Apple Watch where people are really getting into the fitness uh, aspects of it. And, you know, everybody who's wearing an Apple Watch is being ordered by their wrist to stand up every hour. Uh, and it's, you know, people are doing it. I'm doing it. Uh, it's, it's quite a phenomenon. Do you do you have an Apple Watch? I do indeed, and and the only thing that no, I I like the fact that it reminds me to stand up. If I if I, you know, sometimes when the show goes long and I'm sitting here at this desk, it tells me you've been sitting here for a long time. Uh, move it along, buddy. Uh, but what I don't like is when it congratulates me. Uh, I haven't uh, had the time <laughs> lately to to get to the gym or get any exercise at all, and it's constantly saying congratulations. You stood up and walk to the refrigerator. You you must be some kind of Olympic athlete. Uh, it's amazing. You know, I don't want that. I, it's like it just makes me feel bad. So, uh, you know, I, they'll get it right eventually. And I'm, I'm sure I can adjust to the, the expectations of this thing. But for now, it's congratulating me for basically doing nothing. So. That's pretty funny. Yeah, I don't, I don't have an Apple Watch. I'm not much of a watch guy at all. Um, yeah, look. Obviously, it makes sense to really pursue all this fitness stuff because that's that's the low hanging fruit and wearables. But um, we'll see we'll see if it takes off. I mean, we haven't really found out uh, how much the Apple Watch is selling, and and the other wearables are uh, kind of moving along. So um, I don't know. It's it's good good for Google, I suppose. Yeah, that's great. I mean, updates are great, and and this is the Google way. Just keep dribbling out those uh, improvements. RDO plans to introduce a very low-cost subscription plan for streaming music. This is pretty amazing, actually. They'll charge only $3.99 per month for streaming music. Uh, the service is called RDO Select. The catch is that they'll offer only a limited catalog, and they won't offer everything they have. RDO Select will have streaming radio stations without ads, plus 25 songs per day that you can specify. Uh, ben Fox Rubin, I think this is great. That, that's a really great price point. I think that, you know, I think these types of services are very price-sensitive. And uh, the higher end versions that have higher quality music have essentially failed because people don't want to pay twenty dollars a month. They want to, you know, they barely will uh, are willing to pay nine ninety nine, you know, nine ninety nine a month. And here we go uh, with a with a new service or or at least a feature that offers it for four bucks a month. That's a that's a pretty good price point, I think. Yeah, yeah. Rhapsody has a similar service that I think is a is a dollar or two more. Uh, I think that's unradio. So uh, there, there are a lot of efforts out there to try to find what the right 
price point is, what what kind of that sweet spot is for finding out what the music labels will actually be able to stomach and and what consumers are willing to purchase as far as as far as streaming. So it's possible. What is that like four dollars? Yeah, it, my my concern with that is that RDO is is uh, a much smaller player when compared to some of the other guys out there like Spotify or Pandora and Apple is going to be coming out sometime soon. So uh, is this really going to move the needle to to have people pay more attention to RDO? You know, granted, you and I are talking about it right now, but I, I don't I don't really know that it's going to get um, a, a bunch of customers to their door. Uh, maybe maybe a even lower price point might do that, but I, I don't know that they would be able to do that uh, realistically. Yeah, I have no sense of it either. I don't really know what uh, people are willing to pay. Uh, you know, I, I suspect that there are lots of people willing to pay, you know, 10 bucks a month and lots of people who just are willing to just steal the music <laughs> or get it some <laughs> other way or, or just stick with downloads. But uh, it's clear that uh, the, the, the money is shifting from downloads to streaming. And so somebody's going to be making money off streaming. It's probably going to be Apple. It's probably going to continue to be Spotify. Uh, but we'll see. I, I, I wish them luck, though, because a, a low-cost al alternative like this is probably a, you know, a welcome idea. Well, we have a little bit more news for you coming up in just a sec. But first, let's talk about Prosper, uh, a great way to borrow money. You don't want to go to the bank and ask for a loan. That's a terrible uh, way to borrow money. You want to go to Prosper because you can borrow up to $35,000 in as few as five days. And what can you do with that money? You can do all kinds of stuff like pay off high rate credit cards, fix up your house, buy a new car. Uh, you can even do a green loan, which is if you have an environmentally friendly project, let's say you want to put solar panels on your house or something like that. You know, people will come and invest in you and your project. That's how these things get funded. It's a, essentially a matchmaking service between people who have money to invest and people who want to borrow money. You don't want to rack up more debt on your credit cards. Do the opposite. Pay them off. With a loan from Prosper, they funded more than $2 billion in loans. And now for limited time, Prosper is offering Twit viewers and listeners a $50 Visa gift card with your new low interest loan. You can get up to $35,000 in your account in as few as five days and a $50 Visa gift card. Just go to prosper.com slash twit for this special offer. And this is just for Twit fans. In human resources news, Facebook hired former FCC chairman Kevin Martin to run Internet.org, Facebook's initiative to get billions of more people connected to the Internet. Martin was previously an advisor to the company. And Ben Fox Rubin, I'm confused about something. Maybe you can clarify this for me. You know, we've been reporting on Internet.org. I've written about Internet.org in terms of what they do. And, and, you know, they want to have, you know, they want to bring the internet to other people. They've been embroiled recently in a controversy in India where they're being accused of violating net neutrality. Uh, there have been discussions about them having, you know, solar powered drones. We talk about all these things, but I'm having trouble understanding what internet.org itself is organizationally. For example, is it a, is it a nonprofit company that, that Facebook has created in partnership with some cellular carriers? Is it a division within Facebook? Is it a, is it a book club? What is it? What is the what is it organization? Do you have a sense of what internet.org actually is? That is a very good question. I I was always under the impression that it was division within Facebook, but I, I could be wrong about that. So I, I think with calling it a dot org, that obviously gives it at least some in, in, you know interpretation that maybe it's a nonprofit. Obviously, they're trying to present it as being this uh, societal good project, but um, I don't know. It's it's also from Facebook, so obviously Facebook is also doing it with the intention of trying to get more people on the internet to get more Facebook users or get more consumers out there on the internet. So um, I, I in in that sense, it, it it's important to know exactly what the relationship is there. With yeah, Facebook. Exactly. I mean, Facebook itself uses euphemisms. They call it a partnership. They call it an initiative. And yet it has a kind of a, I guess somebody's like kind of like a CEO of it or something. Somebody's in charge of it. So, you know, is this just Facebook? Just, you know, like you say, just uh, advancing the interests of Facebook? Or is the, have they spun this out and they've genuinely created this uh, this independent entity that benefits mankind and has a separate board? Uh, and I would like to know, if you know, if you're watching this and you know what internet.org is organizationally uh, and can explain it to me, send me an email to tnt at twit.tv. I'd love to know 
more about what internet.org is exactly besides just some thing that has flying drones. It's got to be more to it than that. Google's public policy and communications chief, Rachel Whetstone, is quitting Google and joining Uber, where she'll essentially have the same role in the new company. She'll be replacing David Plouffe, who's a former advisor to President Obama and who will now advise Uber CEO Travis Kalanick and also sit on the Uber board. This guy is a professional uh, advisor. Uh, sweet, It's a sweet job, and so we'll, we wish everybody luck, good luck in their new positions. Well, if you... Uh, if you have uh, more information about what's going on with uh, with these positions within Uber, I mean, Uber, we we, we always do these human resources uh, 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 stories, uh, Ben, and I think in the last month, I think maybe 10 of them have been Uber. There's a lot of change over at Uber. So if you have any other thoughts about what's going on there, send us an email to tnt at twit.tv. Well, our TNT fan of the day is Otto Anma in Finland who posted this picture on Twitter. He watches the show while cutting fabric for his company's handmade bags. I actually did a little research on this guy, and they make some really cool bags and, and, and other products, very fashionable stuff over there. So we're glad to, uh, to be part of uh, his work there, and uh, you know, we'd like to know how you watch TNT. Just uh, record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup. You can even send us a Microsoft hyperlapse of how you watch TNT. We'd love to see that. And you can post it on Google+, Twitter, or Facebook. Use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT, and we will find it. Ben Fox, Ruben, thank you so much for coming today. What are you working on these days, and where can people read your stuff? I'm on CNET.com as much as I can be. So uh, I've actually just taken over the e-commerce feed. So oh, wow. I'm, yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a big one. So I'm introducing myself to all the eBay, PayPal, Amazon, Twice, Etsy, God, I could probably go on and on. There is a lot of e-commerce out there. Uh, there was one really exciting thing that uh, happened yesterday with Walmart saying that they were going to push into, what was it, $50 a year for uh, free shipping for yeah. certain members. It's just, it's just being piloted right now. And uh, we'll see how significant it actually turns out to be. But that could be a very interesting competitor to Amazon Prime if it actually does take off. So, uh yeah, we'll keep an eye on that. Yeah, and, and I didn't put that story in the rundown today because it was light on tech. I mean, it's a tech story in terms of watching Amazon.com as a technology company, but it's not a tech story in terms of the fact that it's, you know, Walmart, uh, you know, delivering things. Uh, but I was on the fence, and I, in the end, I decided not to go with it. But it is very, very interesting, and it, it's nice to see somebody doing to Amazon what Amazon does to everybody else, which is really putting the sque squeeze on them in terms of, of – uh, of how much stuff costs, they you know undercutting their costs and and squeezing them uh, monetarily. Uh, do you think that uh, Walmart will actually succeed? In other words, do Walmart customers think of Walmart as a place for ordering things online and having them delivered? Uh, at the moment, probably not. And they would Walmart would have to find a way to undercut Amazon with certain prices because. Um, in many ways, they would have to go after Amazon Prime customers because Amazon Prime customers are already conditioned to do this type of buying. So undercutting Amazon is always going to be very difficult. However, if anybody could potentially do it, it might be Walmart because they're so big. Uh, another one to look out for would be Jet.com, which hasn't even officially launched yet. I think they're in beta right now. And they're uh, also kind of kind of like Sam's Club or Costco. Uh, I think a marketplace is also involved in that as well. And their intention is also to undercut Amazon on pricing. Uh, so maybe maybe Amazon is going to be facing a little bit more heat in the coming uh, years or at least in the coming weeks. But Amazon has obviously been able to manage for the past 20 years very, very nicely. So at, at this point, it's it's kind of Amazon's game and, and other, other companies have to find out how to, how to uh, get an edge on them. So uh, I, I don't know that Walmart will be able to do that or Jet, but uh, they will certainly try. Yeah, my money's on Amazon. Not literally. I don't invest in Amazon, but uh, theoretically, my money would be on Amazon if I did, in fact, invest. Uh, ben Fox Rubin is at Ben Fox Rubin on Twitter, except no substitutions. Uh, ben, thank you so much for co-anchoring with us today. Hey, really appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Mike. All right, take care.
But you can subscribe to Tech News Today on Stitcher, and you can choose another way to subscribe at twit.tv slash TNT. You can watch us live every weekday at 1800 UTC at live.twit.tv. And if you're ever planning to be anywhere near the Brick House in Petaluma, come on in and watch us as part of our live studio audience. Just send email to tickets at twit.tv. If you'd like to help us grow our audience, here's how to do it. Just post a link to twit.tv slash TNT on the social media site of your choice. Tag three friends who you think might like the show, along with your recommendation for them to subscribe. You can follow us on Twitter at Tech News Today TV, and you can follow me on Facebook. Just go to facebook.com slash mike.elgin. Don't miss Tech News tonight at 4 p.m. Pacific. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the Tech News Today. The show was produced by Jason Cleanthes and edited by Anthony Nielsen. My name is Mike Elgin. Thank you for tuning in. We'll see you tomorrow.